Okay, team. So what am I talking about when I say that we shouldn't just go along with all this stuff that the left is demanding? Now, as I've already explained, you have charges against the man who, uh, you know, killed George Floyd. Right. We, we know that he's facing murder charges. We you notice how journalists won't even say allegedly murdered. Now, they'll just say murdered. Allegedly doesn't count when it comes to something that is this racially charged. I, I've just picked that up from the news coverage of it. It is technically true. I should not get it. I should not get in trouble for saying this because I am correct. He allegedly murdered him. That is that is a convention you will see for all. You know, if someone has, you know, chopped off five people's heads and using them as volleyballs, you will still have allegedly said about the case until there's a verdict. But I'm hearing people all, oh, he was murdered by the cop. He was mur I mean, journalists, people can say whatever they want, but I mean, people that this is their profession. OK. Uh, and when I say journalists, people in the media, right? I mean, you know, what's a journalist these days? That's a whole other conversation. So you'll notice there are a lot of changes in how we talk about this, how we discuss this. All of the concessions that the left pretends that we don't make on this issue uh, have already been made. Racism is horrible. Racism as a conservative, is a very easy thing to both define and to reject. Racism is the judgment, positive or negative, about a human being based upon their race, generally defined as their skin color. And if you're a conservative and you believe in universal human rights, natural law, and God, and I think you really have to be to be a conservative, although some would argue on the God point, but certainly natural law applies. You understand that all human beings are inherently equal in worth and dignity and virtue as human beings, and that skin color is irrelevant to their character and to their worth. So, you know, we, we start from this very clear and understood premise that racism is a moral wrong. It is unethical and that police violence against any individual is a moral wrong and we do not we do not want that to happen we want it to be punished but we also understand that it is not possible if your demands are of a perfect society just like if you demand perfect equality in economic terms marxists always have this ability to exploit that they'll just say well society is unequal look at the inequality look at the people that have more and are doing better they must be bad they must be immoral well has there ever been a society where people were truly economically, and I mean in terms of material goods, truly equal? Is everyone equal in terms of talents and abilities and, and health and all these different factors that you could look at? No. No. I mean, there's a reason why in the Bible, you know, do not covet thy neighbor's wife, right? People, there's always something. Whether it's, you know, who's the, who gets to marry the prettiest, you know, the prettiest girl in the, in the village to, you know, who has the biggest house and the most wealth, there's always inequality. And so what we do with with organized, with ordered liberty, with organized societies is set up rules that are rooted in principle that are applicable to all of us and understand that it won't make everything perfect, but it will make for the best overall outcome that that is, in essence, an explanation, a justification for why we have laws. But the law is not a promise that nothing bad will ever happen, uh, quite obviously, because there's still marauding looters running around New York City. And that's quite clearly against the law. So what is it that we are really being asked to do or how should things change? In fact, the only place in the law right now where there is active discrimination on the basis of race is in favor of select minority groups. That is a fact. We call it affirmative action, but it is this is what is happening. And that there are laws on the books right now that merely bringing up, talking to you about those laws, people become very agitated about it. They don't, they don't like it. They don't like that you'll talk. They want the law to stay, but they don't want people to discuss. And this is, and it's the same game that you see played in, in college admissions and hiring for corporations. So there is, in fact, inequality in law, but it is enshrined currently in favor of select minority, not all minorities, certain minority groups. This was referred to by, I believe it was Supreme Court Justice Scalia, 
uh, although it may have been Alito, as the racial entitlement state. So if we're talking about changing laws and ending racism through the law, let's understand that we have largely neutral when it comes to race laws, except in certain areas of, of hiring and where affirmative action uh, is involved. And you're not allowed to even bring up that those exist unless you want, unless you're on the left and favorable to those laws. So so that's one, one part of this. You know, there are already areas of discussion that we cannot have. We are just told to comply. Shut up and do what you're told. Um, I see the usage of this movement. I see the usage of this movement right now for much more than the stated goal of ending police violence. And l let's remember, I saw signs and it's all over the place. Defund cops. This is what they're saying. Why should I have to take seriously a movement? Th there was one person for the anti-lockdown movement that I could find. And I looked at every photo I could. I wasn't allowed to travel to Michigan to see. There was one person who was calling Whitmer Nazi-esque and saying, you know, Whitmer is effectively acting like a fascist, a Nazi. The media reported on the one sign from what I could tell as neo-Nazi support, which, of course, is a complete misrepresentation of what people were protesting in the Michigan State House, well, whatever it was now, weeks ago. And that one, if you find one person at a Trump rally or a Tea Party rally or anything like this, if one person has, say, a Confederate flag, they're all, they're, they're all going to be swept aside by the media as, oh, they're racist. And you'd say, well, is that really, is that really fair if people show up at a protest with a thousand people and there's one or there's one lunatic who has something that, you know, has a Nazi uh, symbol on it that's not supporting Nazism, but is calling a politician a Nazi. Now, if I missed other things at that at the Michigan State House rally, by all means, bring it to my attention. I'm not claiming to have perfect knowledge of every protester, what they said, what they did. But I will note the media is very comfortable dismissing what they consider to be conservative protest on the basis of finding one person that is you know, outlandish or stupid or, or, or racist or whatever it may be. But I see all these signs, defund police, which is almost as stupid a slogan as silence is violence. No, silence is not violence. We do not conflate, and, and I'm going to return to that. That's a very important point in a moment. But we do not conflate these things. Do not allow that. Remember, speech was violence for the left a few years ago when we were pushing back against the craziness of Antifa in the early speech was violence and now silence is violence. It's just whatever they don't want is the problem. And they'll come up with some new slogan to get what they want. Uh, so, you know, this is I mean, as I'm, I'm trying to unpack all this in a way, you won't hear people speak about the protesters in some cases, certainly in the media, but in general with derision about their ideas instead of the, about their right to protest but banning all cops is a flatly and an insanely stupid thing to say to advocate for um and it really is the dissolution of society i mean this is this is the underpinnings in insurgencies and those of you who served in the military know exactly what i'm talking about in iraq and afghanistan why are they always going after cops you know whether it's the taliban or al-qaeda in, if, because if you can undermine and co-opt is even better. Co-opting people on the police force, it's a bigger concern, I think, right now than a lot of folks realize when it comes to the far left. But when you, when you can co-opt people in the police force and undermine their ability to keep people safe, you destabilize the broader society. If you were to get rid of police forces, we'd have a complete destabilization, which any normal person would see as psychotic and reckless and going to lead to you know, mass anarchy and and murders and rapes and horrible things. Ah, but the leftists, the true ideologues of the left, believe it, then you'd have an opportunity to remake America in their image entirely. Right. With a complete breakdown of society can come the complete remaking of society. You don't think that occurred to them? You don't think that this is something that they're look at the rhetoric? How can anyone say abolish, abolish all cops? That's what they're saying. They were saying abolish ICE before, which was open borders. Now they're saying 
you know, lawlessness is good. Yay, anarchy. That's what's happening. How is, how is the media not horrified by this? I saw spray painted on Fifth Avenue when I went to see the aftermath, the damage that was done after the biggest night of looting we've had in New York so far, uh, the night before last. And there was A-C-A-B spray painted in numerous places, big letters. A-C-A-B stands for All Cops Are Bastards. Are, I'm sorry, is this a movement that has a problem with police violence or has a problem with cops? I'm actually, see, this is where years ago when Van Jones and I in that one debate on CNN, which is why they never had me back uh, to debate this issue, because I had covered the riot so closely and knew what they said and knew what the rhetoric was. They couldn't play these games of, oh, it's really just about, you know, community and healing and stop. No, no, there's there's some of that. And there's no disagreement about that. Why do you protest something for which there is no disagreement? For which your your perceived opponents completely agree with you. Ah, because it's a bait and switch. It's why won't you agree with us on this thing? And you say, well, no, I do. And they say, well, no, you have to agree with us on something else now. Or else you're proving that you don't disagree with uh, you don't agree with us on that first thing that I have demanded. You know, this is this is a negotiation of the kind of society we're going to live in that is happening in real time. Is everyone punished for looting? Is is stealing illegal? Is stealing immoral? Is breaking into a store causing destruction and economic loss and also psychological distress and disorder? Is that wrong or is it only wrong if you don't like the people doing it? We're having that debate right now in our society. And I'll give you more evidence as to how that's the case. Because, sure, they'll tell people that they don't like it, but will they really punish it? Will they punish it severely? You know, they sent, remember this, the left sent, and I mean the left at the top reaches of law enforcement, the deep state, the deeply burrowed deep state anti-Trumpers, they sent, what, 30-plus men with long guns and tack gear on to rouse Roger Stone from his slumber in his silk pajamas at 2 o'clock in the morning? But... Do you think that they're going to know they're they're letting them out here in New York? You know, the looters are getting OK, we'll arrest them. It's a revolving door because of, oh, that's right. Bail reform. Bail reform. Which this White House got pushed on some of these, uh, you know, releasing criminal initiatives. And bail reform is all part of this whole. My friends, we we got hoodwinked. And I mean the Republican Party overall. And yes, I mean the White House with this covid lockdown, because we all want everyone to live. We don't want anyone to die of a terrible disease and asphyxiate because their lungs are filling up with fluid. And this is horrible. Right. We all aren't we all on the same team with that one. We're all on the same team. OK, great. And then the left said, we're on the same team. Do as we say, peasant. And we're going to blame Trump. It's all Trump's fault. And we're going to do a terrible job in New York and in New Jersey and in a whole bunch of other places, Michigan, protecting our citizens. And then we're going to just keep inflicting more and more pain on them because we like power and because we don't want to be blamed for the stupid decisions we were made before. So maybe they'll beg for our forbearance going forward if we just keep extending these lockdowns. Wait, I thought we were just I thought we were all just on the same page trying to not die from a virus. Oh, you mean that they leveraged that, they exploited that, they went beyond what that shared moment of principle was. What do you think is going on right now with the left? We all agree that racism is bad. We all agree that police brutality is evil and should be punished. What, what really are they fighting against? When you look at what is happening in these different movements, and, and this is where I'll, I'll start to tell you that some of, the, some of the, the steps that I see, look, people can do whatever they want. I Meaning that if, if you... You know, if you want to post a a all black page on your Instagram in solidarity with George Floyd, by all means, right? You, you're, you have every right to do that. But does the left see that as solidarity with George Floyd or do they see that as, OK, that's the that's a point of entry. Now we have people mobilized to our side. Now we have people that we can use for other purposes on on which you do not have agreement, like banning all cops. You see how this transition happens? This is, cl- this is textbook, textbook, Saul Linsky. That's what is happening. Let's do a thought experiment. 
okay, I'm going to pretend to be a leftist activist agitator. And, and this is what I want to do right now. Um, I, I'm going to play that role and you can respond as you wish at home. Um, so are, are you a racist? No. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. No. Do, do you love people regardless of, of creed, color, background? You just love your fellow human beings. You treat them equally and, and the same. Okay, good, good. Yes. Yes. Me too. Me too. Um, if you're really opposed to racism, would you just do me a favor and, and raise your right hand? Okay. Raise your right hand. Great. Can you leave it up there though for a full nine minutes? Because we want to be in solidarity with, uh, George Floyd. I know it's going to hurt your arm a little bit. Leave it. Come on. Show me the solidarity. Now, once you're done with that, would you jump up and down 10 times screaming? I hate racism. I hate racism. Oh, also, would you make a donation? Do you hate racism? Yes or no? Would you make a donation to a few foundations? Don't worry about their politics that are working against racism. Wait, why? Not? Why won't you do all these things? I thought you said you're opposed to racism. Oh, you mean that? That's something that you would object to. This is what they're doing. This is what is happening. People are being brainwashed into this. They're being blackmailed morally into doing what the left wants them to do. Because otherwise, you know, people ask me, well, why didn't you post a black uh, all black square on Instagram yesterday? Because I didn't want to. Because I've already spoken out about George Floyd's killing a hundred times. And anybody who knows me knows that I think what happened was terrible. And I'm not doing what they tell me to do because I don't have to. But you could take this approach. I mean, this is what you're seeing now. These these rallies where they're having people, you know, all these white people gathering together to, to purge their sins of racism uh, at, at the behest of organizers, leftists like this is what it sounds like. About racism, anti-blackness or violence. I will use my voice in the most uplifting way possible. I will use my voice in the most uplifting way possible. And do everything in my power to educate my community. And do everything in my power to educate my community. I will love my black neighbors the same as my white ones. I will love my black neighbors the same as my white ones. Now, I agree with everything that they're saying. But I'm not joining together with a thousand other people repeating after someone in what seems to be a a religious ritual to purge my sins of racism as if somehow that means that I'm doing these things more. Right. Action is what matters here. What's in your heart is what matters. But what I'm pointing out to you is that we're increasingly seeing from the left, if you won't do these things they're telling you to do, if you will not be mobilized as part of this amorphous movement then then there's a there's a cost then you must be one of the bad guys why won't you do it doesn't cost you anything why won't you jump up and down 10 times and say because i told you to that you hate racism oh i guess you must like racism no that's not going to, that's not going to work at least not going to work with me i'm seeing it work with a lot of people Violence is when an agent of the state kneels on a man's neck until all of the life is leached out of his body. Destroying property which can be replaced is not violence. And to put those things, uh, to use the exact same language to describe those two things, I think really um, is not it's not moral to do that. So, yes, I, I think any reasonable per- excuse me, any reasonable person would say we shouldn't be destroying other people's property. But these are not reasonable times. These are people who have protested against police violence again and again and again, year after year after year. And still we can have videos of law enforcement with witnesses nonchalantly taking the life of of a man uh, for the alleged crime of passing a fake $20 bill. So when we have people who say that uh, people should respect the law, they're not respecting the law because the law is not respecting them. You can't say that that regular citizens should play by all of the rules when agents of the state clearly are not. Here we have a celebrated Pulitzer Prize winning uh, recently. I think it was last year. Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter and the main author behind the 
uh, factually, largely, or in, in important ways, I should say, fraudulent 1619. I mean, there are huge omissions and things that are not true. And, but, you know, and they've admitted that. And there have been all these historians, including some liberal historians, who are like, look, you're just, you're just not right on the facts here. But it doesn't matter because it's about a movement. It's about politics, friends. It's not about, it's not about getting the history right. The 1619 Project, in that sense, served its, its purpose for the left. Continued racial division and bring us closer to uh, the separations of the bonds that hold us together as Americans and increased Marxism and authoritarianism and all those things that we all know the left is just, ooh, they're always waiting for that, always waiting for those openings. But if you hear what she said, if you really listen to the words, here is a New York Times writer who is saying, and I think she just vocalized what's in her head without understanding what the rest of us would take away from it, uh, that looting is OK right now. So New York Times reporter, she's saying, uh, you know, in normal times, people could say that looting is bad and breaking the law is bad, but these are not normal times. Because one because one black man was killed in Minneapolis. Let, let, let's be very clear about what the claim of the left is right now, because one black man was killed in Minneapolis by a police officer almost certainly murder, or rather we all believe it to be murder, but it has not yet been uh, adjudicated by a court. But because one black man was, he was certainly killed by him, killed by a police officer, and it is uh, it looks to be murder to all of us who saw that video. That That is, she is telling you, a justification for people who are losing their stores, who are losing... Uh, merchandise who are having buildings burned down who are being attacked i we somehow we don't talk about this there's all these videos out there you know uh, there's the woman in rochester beaten with wooden boards by five or six full-grown men there are the there's the horrible beating of that guy who was trying to defend a store with a sword in dallas uh there you know there are officers we're, we're not even Notice how it's harder to bring up. It's harder even for me reading the news all the time, all day long, to remember off the top of my head all the different officer-involved incidents because the incidents with police officers during these riots that get all of the attention are alleged excessive force. And then we turn, it turns out in many cases there was no excessive force. It was completely legit, legitimate. It's already happened a few times. But not the cops getting hit by cars. Certainly, I've already talked to you about how little coverage the left will give to the murder of David Dorn by a looter. So I would want to ask Nicole Hannah-Jones, is the anger that people feel, whatever that is, does, is Antifa a part of that? Or is it only, is it, is it African-Americans? Are, they have a, a special uh, dispensation from Nicole Hannah Jones to loot, but Antifa doesn't. I, I would want to ask her this. I'd want to know where the lines are. I'd want to know who, because she is saying that the looting in normal times would be bad, but these are not normal times. Those are her words. Okay, so basically, yeah, look, you're going to have some looting because people are upset. And that's what we're being told. And okay. Well, what do we make then of the murder of a black retired law enforcement officer in St. Louis? Do you think if I go into the Twitter feeds of the most prominent left wing news anchors, journalists, do you think that they have a lot of expressions of, uh, of solidarity with David Dorn? Do you think so? You want to run that experiment? Go ahead. Do it yourself. I guarantee you the answer is no. Why? Was was his African-American life stolen from him by a looter somehow worth less to the African-American community? W what exactly? Oh, they're, they're going to tell us again. It's about oh, it's about police violence. OK, let's talk about that for a moment. Nine people from the African-American community killed under circumstances that could, in fact, be unjust and be murder last year. Nine. Three hundred and twenty million Americans, folks. Um, how many thousands and thousands of people killed in the black community across the country year in and year out by other people, predominantly other African-Americans? Where's the oh, no. But because we're going to we're going to be told that if one per if one law enforcement officer kills a member of the black community next year, do we still have systemic racism? 
What, what about if you see when you erase all sense of proportionality and factuality and judgment, anything goes right. Who knows? What if next year we have a year not a single unarmed African-American man is killed by police? Does, does that mean no riots or does that just mean, no, there'll be riots, but they'll be for all the African-Americans killed unarmed by police in the past. Where does the left draw the line? You either have a principle that you do not loot, you do not break the law, you do not do these things because it is wrong, or it's just a question of the whims of the mob. And here you have a New York Times writer who's just telling you, yeah, it's the whims of the mob. Whatever they want to do is what they can do. Sorry. Oh, well, that's a, that's a bit of a, of a shock. Now, th- that also then brings me to this, this subject, and I, I, can un- I can understand people of goodwill on both sides of this discussion i I can see it from the perspective of law enforcement both tactically and emotionally i can understand why some members of the law enforcement community uh would kneel in solidarity at some of these protests depend and it's all situational is the protest being you know respectful is the protest really about raising their voices in dialogue or are they throwing, you know, rocks and bottles and things. And then there's a few people who are saying kneel in solidarity or else as, as if there's some kind of a threat behind this. Uh, but I will tell you this, it, it to me, once you have police on the job who are taking what increasingly can look like and, and now they may not think of it as a political stance, but this is a very politicized issue. We know from all the prominent Democrats out there that they view this as a mobilization against Donald Trump. They're already talking about it. They're already saying it. So once you have police that start to show that there is they have an ideological allegiance while on the job, while in uniform, I think that's a precedent that we will come to regret. Now, that doesn't mean that in every case I can't understand why cops would do the would, would kneel. But um, I also feel like police, when they're when they are engaged in that role, should be solely focused on the job. And, you know, look, when I was a CIA officer, we had the Hatch Act, the federal government. You weren't allowed. Now, people might say, well, taking a knee isn't political. Really? I thought taking a knee when Colin Kaepernick did it and all these different NFL players did it uh, and other people did it, too, in solidarity. uh, I thought it was explicitly political. I thought it's all about political change. Now it's not political. Also, I would tell you this. uh, There seems to be a lot of pressure that if you don't do the things the mob wants in these cases, if you won't do what they tell you to do, you're a bad person. And that's a precedent that's also going to get abused and abused and abused. So would I would I kneel at one of these protests? I, should I? I mean, what, that audio I played for you where they're all repeating that, at least on the uh, on the social media account where I saw that first, and it's now going viral. That was supposed to be a according to the social media account, um, people atoning for their white privilege. And this is how they're atoning for their white privilege. Um, am I supposed to do that? Or do I have to do that every day? What what how far into this left wing narrative do I have to do I have to play? Do I have to uh, accept their version of the facts before I can actually just go about living my life? What 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 exactly is is at stake here, my friends? Really think this one through Uh, when I see cops kneeling, uh, law enforcement officers hate bad cops because it makes their job harder and it undermines their work, which is dangerous and underpaid and, you know, there are all kinds of risks and unpleasantness and stuff that you're dealing with all the time. Bad cops make that harder. The cops are not in favor of police brutality. Every person you talk to in the NYPD, and I've talked to a bunch of them the last few days, will tell you that what happened to George Floyd is terrible. So, OK, you're taking a knee in solid. Are you taking a knee in solidarity with George Floyd and George Floyd's family? That I can understand. Are you taking a knee in solidarity with ending the plague of um, young black men being murdered wantonly and recklessly and systematically by police? Now you're playing into a an inflated political narrative. Because I told you, I mean, unless you think that not nine people being killed in a country of three hundred and twenty million people is 
a you know is, is a massive national level police wide crisis that we all have to be lectured about and, and constantly apologizing for. How much more apologizing are we supposed to do? You know, I, I, I'm supposed to admit I, I've seen this game too. admit your white privilege. Why? Why, why do I and, and what does that mean? And, and if someone tells me to admit my white my white privilege, do I then get to ask, um, do I then get to bring up, well, hold on a second, you know, if, if I'm applying for a job and somebody with near my qualifications, but who is a minority gets it instead of me, am I, do I not, am I not allowed to question the uh, ethics and legality of that because of my white privilege? I, I want to know how far do I have to go on the way. Now, friends, you see, you just start getting wrapped up around, you start getting wrapped up into nonsense at some point because... What is any of what are they really saying? What does any of this really mean? The American people overwhelmingly and I see it every day. I'm, I was before the lockdown. I'm here in New York City. It's one of the most diverse places on earth. We, you know, we get along very well. We're doing our best. We're all trying. We live in a remarkably peaceful and prosperous, incredible society. And yet our children are being taught in schools that we are irredeemably racist and terrible and that our foreign policy is imperialistic and awful and there's and, and you know there's so much of, of a focus put on these negatives, and I can tell you just from from uh, from what I've read about in in psychology. I'm not a psychologist, but you know you can become effectively paralyzed as a person by entirely focusing on the negative. Anybody can do it, and it can be a, a, a symptom usually of major depression. You could sit around all day long and just in, and end up doing nothing productive and feeling nothing but misery. When you think about the fact that we're all going to die, everyone you know and love is going to, you know, I could do this. And, and all these things are true, but you still move forward and you still have a context for how wonderful and beautiful and precious life, your life and the lives of all those around you are. Um, a lack of context can be a, a, a hindrance in so many ways. And we're seeing that lack of context in American life right now where we're, we're being told, we're being forced into a false narrative of America as a deeply soaked in racism, evil place. And if you don't agree with that, they will come after you and they demand obedience to the narrative. No, no. I love people of all colors and I do not care what color a person is. And every conservative that I know, every person that every person that I consider a good human being, irrespective of their politics, agrees with that. And that is the American way now. So what, what does that get factored into any of this? You know, this is going to other places next. You know, this is a mobilization for it's a mobilization for anti-Trumpism, just like the was the March for Science really about science was the March for Women really about women. This is not really ultimately going to be used to address police brutality, I assure you. But if you say that right now, they're going to yell at you and say that's, oh, you know, how could you? OK, well, let's see what happens in a month. Let's see what this turns into. Let's see what the movement becomes. I've always believed and continue to believe that the National Guard is best suited for performing domestic support to civil authorities in these situations in support of local law enforcement. I say this not only as Secretary of Defense, but also as a former soldier and a former member of the National Guard. The option to use active duty forces in a law enforcement role should only be used as a matter of last resort and only in the most urgent and dire of situations. We are not in one of those situations now. I do not support invoking the Insurrection Act. OK, Secretary of Defense, who's a pretty low key member of this administration, I got to say, I don't have a you know, I come from the intel world, which is a little different than the well, it's very different than the DOD world. Uh, I don't have a good read on this guy, so I can't bring you, you know, a lot of the people if someone runs one of the big intel agencies or the bureau law enforcement and intel side i've always got my people i can ask what's this person what's this person's deal what are they really like i don't know about esper but i think look if he's saying national guard should be used not active duty military mm, i mean 
Is that is I, I think that seems to be the distinction that he's making here. What happens when they can't? Uh, uh, what happens when they can't actually control cities like New York? What happens when you know all of a sudden we're in a circumstance where the police are told to crack down, but the the looting is too widespread? And we've already been through that. It's not like this is theoretical, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna trust this to Democrats who. Don't really look the, the truth is Democrats favor the narrative of oppression slash Black Lives Matter slash this movement to end police. Democrats are more ideologically and emotionally aligned with that than they are with doing what's necessary to stop this stuff. That's where we are. That's that's where we are. So I, I can't say that I have a lot of confidence that all of a sudden police forces. And also, how do we know that this won't even if it calms down for a few days? What if it comes back in a week or two? That's what I want to know.